Welcome to Fun Pilot Podcast, where we are unpacking opinions and changing destinations. I am your host, Shirley Altador, where each week we will chat about how to rise strong out of all types of obstacles that come with relationships. Through personal life experiences and discussions ranging from infidelity, trust, forgiveness, sex, heartbreak, self-love, and so much more. I am passionate and obsessed to provide guidance to every woman to create a better life. Let's dive in, pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. With me, your virtual girlfriend. Today we have Mr. J, who is a betrayal trauma practitioner and interpersonal relationship coach. He holds a master's degree in education, is, has ministry credentials, and a certified special education teacher, an author of a children's book, I Am Loved Right Where I Am, a veteran of the United States Army, an inspirational public speaker, and an adoptive parent with so much more information to provide. Mr. J, how are you today? I'm awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, Shirley. No problem. I appreciate you as a guest. I appreciate all my guests, and they don't realize how much of an impact they have on the show. So I'm going to pass you the mic to tell us a little bit more about yourself and go into your story. All right. Um, So I am Mr. J, and I like boating and fishing. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a different podcast. I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) So, <laughs> it's okay. People want to hear that as well. Get personal with okay. them. Well, I don't like either, to be honest with you, I, although I do love the water. Um, so uh, let me just get started here and obviously interrupt me at any point because I will just take over the next three hours. Um, uh, I don't remember much of my life before, say, six and a half, but I do know that around the age of six and a half, um, our, our family bought a house. And uh, we, it was one of our first houses. It was very nice. And um, we went away for the weekend one time and we did not realize that while we were gone, the house caught on fire. So when we came home, uh, we pulled into our driveway with nothing but our chimney sitting in our driveway. The house completely burned down to the ground. All of our family heirlooms, our first haircuts, our toys, you name it, completely gone. And my parents couldn't afford um, uh, house insurance, which I don't even know how this was allowed, but maybe things were different 40 years ago. Um, so so we had no insurance and um, we had to wind up. Uh, my mother took me and my two siblings to her brother's house. He lived in a small trailer and my father kind of went to go find work so we could get ourselves back on our feet again. So uh, we stayed in my uncle's small trailer for a while, and um, it was very small. So uh, at the end of the night, when we, it was time for bed, uh, we would all kind of huddle on the living room floor. And um, after my mother and my siblings fell asleep, that's when my uncle would wake me up and bring me into his bedroom so I can thank him for, um, for opening his house to us. Um, and I always tell people, I don't know what was worse being um sexually abused by an uncle or the silent internal screams the next morning when you're sitting at the breakfast table and everybody's just carrying on as if nothing ever happened but anyways um we eventually moved more towards a city um and we couldn't find a house so we rented but by this time my mother kind of was away from my father for a while and she i think got a taste of freedom i guess so she wanted to separate from my father so he didn't really move into the apartment um and what she did was she turned our house into a um endless endless party with with alcohol and drugs and sex um Sorry, did you say something? So I have a few questions before you continue. No, you didn't say something. You're sparking questions. <laughs> so now, okay, so six and a half, your whole life changed. Obviously, it's reasons like this probably why it is mandatory to have 
homeowner's insurance before you even get to the closing, because probably tremendous amount of situations like this happen. No one called them. No one contacted them. But I guess 40 years ago, what? There was no phone, Shirley. So, you know, I'm still thinking now presently. Yeah. Well, we so so we bought a house like out in the country area. And, you know, back then uh-huh. you didn't really need a lot except a handshake. You know, here you go. So I, exactly. I don't really think there was all these policies and procedures and protocol that are in place now. And when we went away for the weekend, um, we went to a family member's house um, and we didn't even have a phone in our house. So nobody even knew how to get a hold of us in any capacity. So when when we came uh-huh. back, like I said, um, there was just the, the chimney and we we didn't we were clueless as to what to do. You know, we did go to, uh, the uh, Red Cross, I think, um, uh, who basically just gave us some toys and some blankets and said, okay, when you move, you know, we'll, we'll give you some basic necessities. But like I said, we stayed with my uncle. Now, let me just back up for one second. If you don't mind, I was six and a half when we bought the house. I was about seven when the house burnt down. When we moved, I was getting close to eight. So, so like a lot of times passing, obviously I can't go through the whole story or else we'll be here for days. But when we moved into the city, into our new house, I was about eight now. Um, and this was the time where, uh, like I said, you know, we, we lived in a, uh, house of constant blaring ACDC and drinking and drugs and, um, and sex. Um, and you know, it was, it, it, it was it was just horrific to be honest with you. So basically, um, I would, uh, take care of my younger sister because my mother was going through a drinking Mm -hmm. stage. Um, I would, I would, um, wake her up in the morning, get her dressed, uh, feed her, bring her to school. I, I would then have to run, you know, almost two miles to my middle school because I was always late. I would be given detention. Well, I could never stay for detention because then I couldn't go get my sister. So I would always skip detention. Um, so I would get my sister. Then I take her to the library because I did not want to go home. And we would stay at the library as long as possible until we were just, you know, starving. Then I would go home. Um, try to walk my way through the drunken crowd um, and see what was in the pantry, which usually there was, you know, old taco shells or something. Um, Feed my sister, uh, help her with any homework she may or may not have, bathe her, what have you, help her get to sleep. Then I would clean up the throw up, the beer cans, the whole nine yards, um, and then go in my room to sleep and just wait for whatever random stranger decided they wanted to sexually abuse a young boy. Um, and that happened night after night after night. And so at the age of 12, um, I was hospitalized for extreme stress. And I remember when the doctor said he, I just remember him shaking his head and he said, I just don't understand you're 12. Why are you this stressed? And, uh, I just lied. And I said, well, you know, I'm in middle school and I have tests and peer pressure and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, um, this went, this, this lifestyle went on for about another year until I, um, and until I, I, I basically told my mother, um, I'm going to move out and I'll let you keep collecting checks on my behalf. Uh, as long as you don't make any waves with me moving out, I'm done. Can't do this anymore. So, um, it was probably about the age of, um, 13, close to 14, I moved out, but um, obviously didn't have anywhere to go, didn't have any money. So I was on the streets for a while. And um, Okay, Mr. J, hold up. So now <laughs> I have to, the questions just keep on coming. So from six to, from about seven to eight, you were sexually abused by your uncle. And then when you left your uncle's home from about eight to about 12, you were sexually abused by random people. Yeah. And your mom, when she got a taste of that freedom, when you say drinking and sex, she was having sex with random people. Correct. Your father kind of just was like, okay, whatever. Do what you want. Well, he wasn't allowed to come to the house. He wasn't allowed to come around as per my mother's demands or requests. Um, And he didn't really know a lot. He, he, He didn't know a lot. You know, and you know what's interesting? As an adult, I had more challenge and struggles for giving my father than my mother. Now, I don't know if that's because, you know, I'm a boy and, you know, I needed a dad, whatever. But mm-hmm. my mother's boyfriends, and she had a couple, 
at any random time would just mm-hmm. beat me to a pulp for whatever reason, you know, whether I, whatever reason, if I didn't get their beer quick enough, you know, I would just get beat to a pulp. And I remember while I was in a fetal position one time getting pounded on by this random guy, I remember thinking, where's my dad? My dad's supposed to protect me. Where's my, mm-hmm. and it's so weird because he had no idea what the hell was going on. I'm sorry. I just swore. I apologize. Oh, you can swear all the fucking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I usually it don't. Is open but, okay. Door. Um, it totally. All right. <laughs> so, so that was just interesting because the average person would be like, "Oh, wait a minute. Why were you not completely livid with your mother?" But no, I was, I was, I was, um, I was upset with my father because he was supposed to be my dad, and a dad protects their kids, you know, um, from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um. So anyway, uh, did you want to ask another question? Did you want me to continue? I do want to ask another question. Was your sister at all abused? Do you she know? was. Yeah, she was. Okay. And, and that's her story. And th- since it's in... Exactly. But how did it feel at 13 to have to turn your back on her? Um, you know, I'm leaving out a lot. But when she was abused, I was called down to the station um, because they thought I was the one that did it. Um, oh, and, and I'm, 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 re- I'm not mentioning a lot because there's a lot with it, but, um, I was, to make a long story short, I was with a female that night that was menstruating when my sister got abused. So I was full of blood. So when I got called down to the police station, they saw my sister bloody. They saw me bloody. I was absolutely, uh, you know, the one. I mean, until they had to do all of the tests to see that, you know, the blood wasn't the same. But you're talking years ago when tests weren't as rapid as they are today. Um, And again, I don't necessarily want to get on my sister's stuff because it's her story. Um, But I'm happy to answer any questions on my behalf. Okay, we won't take that any further. (laughs) The woman that you were with, was she sexually abusing you or was that something you consented well, to? Well, can a 12 year old consent? I mean. Oh, shit. <laughs> mm. Oh, Lord. So, anyway. This is like, I'm telling you. Oh, oh yeah, but my story understand. ends good. I don't know if you know Lisa Nichols. She says all the time, oh, no, my story ends good. It's all good. So. <laughs> I do know okay. Lisa Nichols. Yes, I so, do. I do. So, anyway. Um, so uh, I was, you know, what, 14, uh, living under the highway, and I just remembered listening to the cars go by and watching the cars go by, and I'd always fantasize, like, oh, where's that family going? I wonder if they're going on vacation together. I wonder if they're going to the beach. I, you know, I wonder what they're talking about. But I remember it was one time uh, after my second gu- a gun to the temple, which, what in the hell are people going to rob from a homeless person? Makes no sense, but whatever. After mm-hmm. the second gun to the temple, I said, this isn't who I want to be. This isn't what I want to be. This isn't, I need to do better. And um, so what wound up happening was I eventually uh, quit school in sixth grade and I got two jobs on two opposite ends of the, um, uh, of town bagging groceries. And the reason I had to do that is because I was underage and they assumed that I was in school, so they could only give me a certain amount of hours to work. So I had to go to one store and say, oh, I can only, you know, I'm, so whatever. Between the two stores, I made enough money to rent a very, very, very small apartment, um, which I loved my apartment. It was $180 a month. It was it was my own. I loved it. Now, don't ask me how in the world somebody rented to a 14-year-old, because I have no idea. I must have been a smooth, suave talker. But I did get my own apartment, uh, paid my own rent. I don't know if you ever heard the song, you got to have a J-O-B if you want to be with me. <laughs> so I was with myself. Hey, I have heard that song. <laughs> huh? But I'm looking at my 14-year-old daughter and I cannot even imagine oh, I know. my child having I know. a job. I know. Oh, my goodness. I know. I, I know. I, I grew up fast. Well, that's what happens when you grow okay. up on the streets, right? So, um... Yeah. So I begged groceries for uh, and lived, you know, alone and and uh, did what I had to do until I was a um, uh, couple years. I did that for you know a couple years, you know, four or five, 
And um, one time I decided the only way to um, really bridge that or close that gap is, is education. So I remember walking to a community college. Now I'm talking, you know, 15 miles from, from where I was. Um, and, and so my legs were beyond done by the time I got to this college. But I walked in and um, I was lot. clueless, completely clueless to the college um, life way. I, I knew nothing. So I remember just going from one person to the next who would send me to this person to go talk to this person. And it was frustrating. But I finally sat across from this um, lady and her name was Mary McMahon. And I told her, I said, I would like to start school. And she said, okay, well, I need your um, high school transcripts. And I said, well, I don't have high school transcripts. She said, well, I need your GED. And I said, well, I don't have a GED. She said, okay, I need a letter from your parents. I said, well, I haven't talked to my parents in years. She was like, well, I I can't help you. I'm not not sure what to tell you. And um, it was a defeating moment. You know, I've had plenty of those in my life. So it was a defeating moment. And um, she said, you know, can you reach out to your parents and um, get a letter from them? I said, I haven't talked to my parents in years. I don't even know if I know where they are. If I did find them, I don't know if they'd write me a letter. There's got to be something. And she said, no, we have our protocol. This is what's needed. Um, You know, are you emancipated? No, I didn't even know what that meant. What 19 year old knows anything in life? You know, not Mm -hmm. to say I don't want to offend anyone who's 19 out there, but um, as far as navigating life. Um, so anyway, uh, there she was just stamping the approval on all these applications in front of her. And with every stamp, my heart was just, you know, just thumping deeper into my seat. And I was thinking, okay, I didn't come this far to to stop here. Something's got to give. And I just remember sitting up in my chair and I said, Mary, I don't know what to tell you except my word. If you do something to pull strings, I will prove to you in the first semester that I am college material. And if I don't, I will walk away. I never saw you. And so she just kept pressing approval, approval, approval on all these things. And I'm sitting here, okay, are you going to answer me at some point? Like, tell me something because I'm going crazy. So she turns around in her chair and she's um, fumbling through these papers in her filing cabinet. And, um... And she's turned around for a while. So I'm thinking, okay, she's just ignoring me. She's waiting for me to leave. Um, So I took a deep breath and um, I decided to accept my defeat and, 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 and leave. And she turned around in her chair and she put a piece of paper in front of me. And she said, if you do not show me that you can uh, be college material in the first semester, we never talked. Well, I went on to graduate with my associate's degree with high honors I went on to graduate my bachelor's degree with high honors and with a lot of hard work and dedication, a master's degree with high honors. So a lot of stuff went into that. Don't get me wrong. I just fast forwarded 10 years, but that's where I am today with a master's degree. Yes. And that is awesome. Now the next question before we're going to fast forward back, why did you not think about reaching out to your father? You know, you told your mom I'm leaving. When I told my mother I was leaving. Yeah. You know, um, I, uh, at this point I became so estranged from my father that it was Mm -hmm. uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, I I didn't see my father for, I think about seven, eight, nine years at one point. So when I did see him and I smoked at the time, when I did see him, uh, now my brother left earlier to go live with my father. Well, he went to go live with friends and my father, he got out of Dodge. But when, um, when I would see my brother with my father, and like I said, I smoked at the time, I would say to my brother, can you ask your dad if I could borrow a few dollars for cigarettes? So I, I, cause I, cause he, I, he was, I didn't know him as my dad. Um, so, so, and that, and that was that's a whole nother topic, a whole nother story, which I'm thrilled to get into because we, we eventually went through some therapy. Um, and now we have the best relationship period. Every single time we talk, which is a couple of times a week, we never uh, hang up the phone without an I love you. Well, that's, that's a good thing. At least it ends from a positive note. You know, of course you can't change what happened from 12 to, you know, the time you guys started reconnecting, but at least now, it's on a positive note and you're talking to your father on a weekly basis oh, yeah. and you're telling each other that you love. Each oh other. yeah. Did you ever get your GED? 
So here's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what wound up happening. <laughs> I went through a semester of college and um, and 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 did my credits and got good grades. And when I was re- trying to register for my second semester of college, the uh, bursar's yes. office asked me, "Are you registered with Selective Service?" And I said, "What's Selective Service?" Again, what does a nineteen-year-old know? And um, okay. she said, "Here, call this number. See if you're registered with Selective Service. You know, blah blah blah." So I'm calling this number, and then I get transferred to this number, and then I get connected to that number, and then I get transferred to this person. Finally, I'm on the phone with a recruiter, an Army recruiter, and uh, I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not interested in the Army at all. I'm trying to go to college. I don't even know how I got on this number. No time. Sorry. And he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Hold on. Let me just talk. I said, no, no, no. I know how these conversations go, and no time for all this. No, no, no. (laughs) He's like, why don't you just come down and we'll have a conversation? Yeah, don't they all start like that? <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll go down and have a conversation. Um, next thing you know, I'm signing away eight years of my life. That wasn't my plan at all. But what wound up happening was you could get into the military with uh, an equivalent degree. And because of my 12 college credits, I had the uh, equivalent of a high school diploma. So that's how I was able to get into the military. Interesting. So, okay, look at that. Yeah. That is so I went away to the military, did my training, did more. Oh my Lord, I have no upper body strength. So I sounded like a female in labor after my fourth push up. I don't even know how I made it through basic. I'm going to be honest with you. So, so, so. <laughs> he said a female in labor. <laughs> they put you to work. You were like, what is this? They did. And, and, and you know what's funny too? I live in upstate New York. Now, a lot of people hear that you're from New York, so they think, oh, you got a chip on your shoulder. You must be in a gang. You're from New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm from Cow Tipping Town, Mm -hmm. way upstate New York. So different. But my drill sergeants would just assume that I was from New York, so they thought I had a chip on my shoulder, so I couldn't do anything without doing push-ups. But let me tell you, man, I I left the military with some pecs. Anyway. Yeah. Um... So, uh, so what I did was I joined the, um, what many refer as the weekend warrior. I did, um, I did reserves. So I did, um, two, two weeks out of the year, one weekend a month. I spent four years in the army while I was going to school, while I was, um, working, while I was living. Uh, and then I transferred my other four years into the air force. Um, and then, oh, okay. yeah. And then, um, when I, I always told myself after I got my bachelor's degree that I wanted to move to the big city, which was New York, because I have a passion for film and television. I do, I do have a, um, mm-hmm. uh, a dual degree, bachelor's degree in psychology and theater. So I wanted to move to New York city and, um, and, uh, pursue film and television. And that's what I did. I gave myself a year to downsize, downsize all my stuff. I downsized all my stuff. And um, moved to the big city, and I pursued film and television. And I can get into all that if you want, or we can move on. I can totally see film in you. (laughs) You're very animated, full of energy. Of course, they can't see you. I can see you. But I can see the energy of you, like, being on Broadway or on TV, just being, like, full of energy because you have that. Even when you came on, you were like, hey. I was like, hey. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, I've been told many times you're extra. <laughs> it's okay. Extra is okay. We all need a little extra of something in this world. So now what's your relationship like with your mother, Jay? So, um, you know, throughout the years, it was, um, she, you know, she did kind of calm down with the drinking. She did calm down in life. And, okay. um, okay. but over the years, uh, she really had a disdain that I was getting close with my father um, because for some reason my father was like the enemy. Um, And so uh, about 10 years ago, she told me, if you're going to have a relationship with my enemy, I can't have a relationship with you. And, um, and so that's the last time I talked with my mother. Uh, Now I love my mother. 10 years. I love my mother. I miss my mother. I forgive my mother. Um, but I've learned to love her from a distance and that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. And that's all you can do. Yeah, that is okay. Yeah. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Some people say all the time, one of the hardest things to do in life is to, um, is to leave your family, um, you know, if, if they're toxic. And I say, 
I don't necessarily think that's true. One of the hardest things to do is to be okay leaving your family to the point where you can put your head on the pillow at night and say, I did my due diligence. I'm at peace with this. I'm good. Because you can leave a toxic family member and, and, and still be, you know, a raging bull and, and have all these issues that will come out in one way or another in your life. The key is to love your mm-hmm. family member from a distance and have peace with it. And that takes work. And I agree with you with that. You're not the first person who told me that um, my parents and I, we have a good relationship, but not as tight as it should be. There's a little toxicity that's involved, but I've learned that loving them from a distance is still a healthy boundary. And it is okay to do that because there are some, you know how they say, um, uh, there's nothing like family and you know, you shouldn't like disown your family and all this stuff, which I get, I understand, but toxic doesn't have a label. It doesn't matter if it's family or if it friends in my eyes. So if a family member is toxic and you need to step away or keep them at a distance, it is okay. Some people don't realize that just because they're like your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your cousin, it doesn't mean you still have to be part of that toxic. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is that even a word? Toxicity. You know, Shirley, I'll tell you something. Toxicity. It's not only okay, it's necessary. Because I'll tell you something. Yes. Uh, so we adopted our, our son um, 10 years ago, which was right about the time, you know, mm-hmm. with, with my mother. We adopted my son 10 years ago. And every single time I got off the phone with my mother, I was so short with my baby. I was so, I my nerves were already like, mm-hmm. my cup was full. So it's not only okay, it's necessary. Mm-hmm. And you know something, I'm going to tell you something because uh, we we are a very spiritual family, my core family, um, Christians, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We read, eat, love the Bible. We are, we are Christian. And so mm-hmm. this is my thought. My thought personally is when God puts a family together, you better do all your due diligence and turn every stone you can to stay together because God just didn't put you together for no reason. Now, having said that, Absolutely. Yes, blood is thicker than water, but water doesn't stain. Blood does. So you got to be very careful Mm -hmm. with your life, Mm -hmm. your temple. You're in charge of that to make sure your boundaries are being respected. Your life is being respected. If not, it is completely okay. Not only okay, necessary to love people from a distance. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Now, did she embrace her grandchild? No. Or how was she? No, no. no. Uh, uh, sh- um, and, and, and I think that's, I mean, listen, you're a parent. I don't have to tell you, slap me in the face, spit in my face, what, but look at my child wrong. It's on, you know? Um, so, yeah. you know, yeah. she told me one point, um, it was mother's day and I sent her a card with our son's picture in it. And, um, she sent me a text and she said, Please stop giving me gifts saying and saying grandma, because I, I know that um, Luke can't write grandma, you know, some some ridiculous crap. And I'm like, ooh OK, mm, you know what? Mm, I'm going to have to start loving you from a distance because Lord have mercy. You're about to start testing yeah. my relationship with God. <laughs> yeah, that's heavy for um, your mom to say that. How did this woman change from. The mother that she was when you guys bought that house, when you were staying at the uncle's house, because none of this was showing until now you go into your own place and she's literally this vile individual. Well, you know something? This is why I say I love my mother and I forgive my mother, because I think my mother, my mother had seven brothers and she lived on a farm. So I don't think I have to say much more mm-hmm. than that. I, who knows what she experienced? That's number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, life has a way. Listen, I don't care who you are. Life has a way of of really handing you some pretty difficult, challenging cards to play. And I think you could either choose to p- be proactive and play them in your favor, or you can let them defeat you. Um, listen, l- l- life... L- People say all the time, oh, I, I'm not going to play this game. I'm not going to play. Listen, life is a game. You're on the board. Your mm-hmm. job now is to know how to strategically make the next move. But I think some people 
um, let life jade them um, and let life jade them profoundly. And I just think, you know, that's what happened with my mother. She, you know, uh, I don't know what happened traumatically in her childhood, but I just think life over the years uh, dramatically jaded her. And um, mm -hmm. and she's the person she is. And I'm going to love her enough to know that her hurt makes her decisions. Gotcha. And I'm glad to know that you have that understanding and that you can rationalize. You know what? I'm not angry with you. I forgive you. I'm going to love you from a distance, but I'm not going to let you bring your toxicness into your toxicity. <laughs> Why do I keep on saying toxic? It's all good. Toxicness. Your toxicity into my family life and harm my children because I totally understand my children are my world granted I have a life I have to live and I have to keep myself stable but you disrespect them it is a problem and it doesn't matter what label you hold in my life it's not going to be nice yeah. <laughs> so I totally get what you're saying now let's move on to a more pleasant conversation about adopting the kids your son was the first child that you adopted but how did you and your partner come to that decision so because I'm gonna tell you yeah. two of the people I love because when I saw that you uh, had two adopted children I absolutely love it because you know Sean T and his partner I love watching them and how they're raising their boys so how did you two come to that decision and do you still talk to the surrogate mother or if you had a surrogate mother so um First of all, I'll just tell you, when I uh, moved from upstate New York to more to the New York City area, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I was in a few things, uh, and this is going somewhere, so just bear with me. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I was on Sex in the City a few times. I was on Criminal Intent. I was in, you know, backgrounds okay. of some movies. I wrote, recorded um, a dance album, and I would gig, you know, throughout the tri-state area. Uh, believe it or not, I, I, I joined a very, very thriving, well-known Jewish boy band, and I'm not even Jewish, but they were relatively known. It was an awesome, awesome gig. We were even booked on the Jimmy Kimmel show. So I, I loved I loved um, pursuing film and television, and um, I was doing a lot, and I was really enjoying what I was doing. But you know what they say, you don't find love, love finds you. So one day I'm just uh, exactly. living and all of a sudden I'm like, ooh, wait a minute. I got some butterflies in my stomach. What's up with this? Let me investigate a little. <laughs> so <laughs> that investigation, surely led me into a rider truck going down to Georgia because my other half got into law school. Now, going down to Georgia was never in my life plan at all, but... You know how life goes. You're on one mission. All of a sudden, life is like, no, I think I want you to take this path. So you either embrace it or fight it, whatever. So um, we went down to Georgia, Absolutely. which, by the way, I made a promise to myself that I was never going to say y'all. Never going to say y'all. But I'll tell you what, while in Rome, do as the Romans do, because I started teaching school down in Georgia. <laughs> and before I know it, I'm walking into my class saying, y'all do your homework last night? <laughs> So never I'm say never. I'm telling you, you know where you are, you adapt. Exactly. You adapt the you language. You do. You do. And you don't need to remember no, it. No, no. So anyway, uh, we're in Georgia. And a couple of years after that, um, Eric, my spouse, uh, took me to mm -hmm. uh, Italy. And we went to Rome. And then we went to Florence. And then we went to Venice. Mm -hmm. Venice is absolutely breathtakingly romantic. I would live there in a heartbeat. And it was the last night of Venice, and we we're it was kind of like a light rain, and we were walking mm -hmm. side by side under the umbrella, and he stops and mm -hmm. goes to one knee, and he takes out a ring, and he asks me if I'd make him this happy forever. I'm thinking I'm being punked or something. I'm looking around for the camera. I was like, I didn't think this was, you know, <laughs> really true and going on. So I said, serious? So um, after, you know, some tears, I said, sure, I, I'd be a fool not to. So... Uh, so, so it was that night we got engaged. Now, fast forward, I just want to say, next November, we'll be together 20 years. So I will pat One myself time. on the back because Lord One have time. mercy, marriage can be hard. It's a blessing. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But man, that mountain can, can have some stones in your feet at times trying to climb it. Yeah. Anyways. That is so true. You know, climbing that mountain is not always easy. No, 
No. Oh, no, 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 mm-hmm. no. Um, and I don't know if you ever reach a summit. You just keep climbing. <laughs> Yeah, that's what you got to do. The rocks will fall, you'll slip. And sometimes you'll just stay there. Be like, I ain't moving. Fuck. Oh, yeah. I'm just not gonna move. I need to stay here right now and get get, gather myself. But after a while, you just keep going. Keep on. Yeah. So, um, so uh, so anyways, fast forward. uh, uh, We, um, we, we had a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful big wedding in upstate New York. Um, married at a beautiful church. The ceremony was beautiful. And then we went to Greece for our honeymoon. And it was the day we got back from Greece, we decided to start working on um, our adoption uh, paperwork. Now, we did have a discussion, you know, do we want surrogacy? Do we want to do this? Do we want to blah, blah, blah? But um, because, you know, just because you're gay doesn't mean you can't have kids. Your stuff still works. But, you know, we just figured there's a lot of kids exactly. out there that 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 really need a home, some love, blah, blah, blah. So we had to uh, start what's called a birth mother book. I don't know if you're familiar at all with a birth mother book. But when you're going to the adoption process, you have to make a book where the birth mother who's going to give up the child reads. And I'm going to tell you something, oh, Shirley. I've heard of that. That's what it's called. Yes. A birth mother book. A birth book. mother book. Okay. So, so now, do you know what, you know what the hardest part of the birth mother book was? How in the world do you address a birth mother? Like, do you say dear friend? Well, no, she's not your friend. Do you say dear birth mother? What if she doesn't like that term? Do you, like, what, how do you address a birth mother? So we were scratching our head for days over that one. But anyway, a birth mother book is, you know, hi, this is me. This is how I was raised. This is what I do, blah, blah, blah. And then the next page is your spouse. Hi, this is me, blah, blah, blah. And then the next page is this is us. And this is what we do, blah, blah. Got it. So <clears throat> we uh, went to the adoption agency and we gave them our book. And um, they said, uh, okay, thank you for everything. Now just leave and pretend, you, you know, go on with your business. Because you, you could hear from us in four months. You could hear from us in four years. You don't know. All depends. So uh, it was about it was about thirteen months after that I got a call went by, and um, okay. it was uh, from the social worker, and she said, uh, "Hey Jay, I, I, are you home?" And I said, "Yeah." And she said, "Are you sitting down?" I said, "Okay, why?" <laughs> she said, "Is Eric home?" I said, "Okay, stop with the questions. What's going on?" Because like my blood pressure's up here. <laughs> she said, "We did have a birth mother in here who looked at about." Um, <laughs> 15 birth mother we gave her like 15 birth mother books and yours was number 11 Mm -hmm. and she said after about the fourth page she closed the book and she said this is the family i want to go with so this was on a thursday she said do you want to um meet the birth mother and we said yes so we met the birth mother um the following day and then the following tuesday we're in our first sonogram and we were in every doctor visit thereafter until she went into labor Uh, I held her leg and neck, Eric cut his cord, and uh, two days later we hugged and kissed and um, went our separate ways. And that was the adoption of our son. Oh, that's the bus. Okay, so you guys been together 20 years. 10 years ago he was born. So the first 10 years you guys were childless. Well, yeah, but we were, you know, we, you know, I was getting my master's degree. Eric was getting his doctorate degree. We were living. We were, you know, we were... Got it. Trying to. Got it. And she allowed you to be in the room because sometimes that's not always the case. <clears throat> Listen, we had the most perfect, two perfect adoptions. We, we met her, I think, on a Thursday. The following Tuesday, we're in our first sonogram. And every time the doctor came into the room to ask her a question, like, you know, okay, if this is a boy, do you want him circumcised? Or do you want vitamin K in his eye? Every time she asked him a question, she would say, ask his parents and point to us. So, so she was respectful from the beginning. Yeah, and here she was, like nineteen years old. Like she, she was a saint. <clears throat> anyway, oh, she was young. Yeah. She was now young. she didn't want to. She wanted to totally emotionally divorce herself from this child, this baby. So when like we would listen to the heartbeat, we would wear headphones because she didn't want to hear the heartbeat. The adoption plan was when the cord was cut. The she wanted the baby ushered out of the room. She didn't want to hear him crying. Um, so. You know, what's interesting you say that like she acknowledged you guys, but then there was a part of her that was so cold. Well, yes, yes. Although I think I think she just had to emotionally divorce herself so she didn't get attached because then it would just make it more harder 
with the whole process. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you something. So about six months after, um, now, so we hugged and kissed and left the hospital and went on with life and that was it. Uh-huh. But six okay. months after um, this all happened, we got a call from the adoption agency and the adoption agency said, um, Jason, would you be willing to um, uh, give a speech and do a Q&A with a group of, a, a room full of, you know, potential foster parents? And I said, are you asking me to get up in front of a group and talk? You ain't got to ask me twice. Sure. So I said, yeah, fine, great, and dandy. <laughs> so the next day. Is your partner the opposite? Oh, you don't even trust. Listen, listen. My Eric is an attorney and he is bullet point. He is bully. Every time I tell Eric, so I'm yeah. going to say, Eric, listen, long story short, he'll say, okay, then somebody else has to tell me. <laughs> I can only imagine there cannot be two of you. In no. Oh, my you Lord. You are just a ball of energy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So <laughs> even let me tell you, I have to do I have to say this because before we even started and I hit record, he was a ball of energy. Then he didn't have his headphones <laughs> and you could just see him. Honey, honey, do you have headphones? <laughs> it's like he is hysterical i'm sorry i just had to add that piece in because you are just you talking and everything about you you're just full of energy and life like you really truly can wake up a room if you're in there because you're just so much yes alive. yes now let me tell you something that comes with both a blessing and a burden <laughs> now do you ever see the machines in the hospital when people flatline it's like eh. yeah okay that's that's my spouse yes. that's eric he could have the best day the worst day the best news the worst news is like eh. It's like, dude, do you have a pulse? <laughs> Me? I get up in the morning. I am like that EKG machine. It's like, oh, it's like, you know, nonstop. Yeah. So my poor kids are like, you know, holy crap. I, I'm going to, depending on what they want, or, you know, what kind. Anyway, I just wanted to go back to my story real quick before I, uh, well, because I'm always going off on a tangent. So the, the adoption agency called the next day <laughs> okay. and they said, um, Amanda, which was our birth son's birth mother's name which is our son's birth mother's name. Uh -huh. They said, Amanda wants to know if you wouldn't mind if she is sitting in the room listening to you talk. And I said, I could care less. Oh, yeah, of course, no problem at all. Oh. So then we get a call the next okay. day and they said, Amanda wants to know if she can be on stage with you talking with you because that way it'll give per, you know perspective um, a, a parents both sides of the story. And I said, absolutely, I'd be thrilled with that. No problem at all. So we go into this room, um, and now Luke is nine months old, right? So she mm -hmm. meets Luke for the first time. She meets Luke for the first time. Uh, she doesn't know anything about him. She just she's she's holding him. She's just holding him, and I'm talking, and then she's talking, and I'm talking, and then she's talking, and um, I go to cue my spouse to talk and he waves me off like, no, please, you just talk. I don't want to be up front and anybody, whatever. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, I got it. I'm all good. So, um, anyway, so at the end, uh, where it was questions, which I, which I, uh, appropriately named Q and gay, somebody raised their hand and they said, I have a question for Amanda, the birth mother. And, um, they said, it's just, I'm finding it hard wrapping myself my head around this you carried this child for nine months you you didn't see it for nine months because it's been with you know jason and eric now you've been holding it the entire talk when you leave here you're not gonna see this child like help me understand this and this this woman who was barely 20 she said this child was never mine. I was just the host of this child, but Jason and Eric were always this child's parents, and they're going to be the parents when we leave here. And I thought for a, I mean, that's profound for a 50-year-old, but for a 20-year-old to say that, I just thought that was so profound. But I'm going to tell you something, and there's a reason I'm telling you this. When we left the, when we left the little discussion time, we walked mm -hmm. Amanda back to her car. And um, I said, Amanda, do you have any questions for us at all? And she said, yeah, I have one. She said, what did you name the baby? Because, you know, she didn't know, she didn't know we named the baby Luke. And, um, I, and I told her we named him Luke. And, and, 
And then I told her why. Um, first of all, ever since I was 16, I wanted a boy and a girl. I wanted a Luke and a Sylvia. So, so I got my Luke. Mm -hmm. But the reason I'm telling you this is because fast forward five years, we now moved to upstate New York. We bought a house. We're living. We go into the adoption agency because we want to add to our family. We want to give Luke a sibling. The adoption agency was working at a glacial speed. So I tell Eric, why don't we go into foster to adopt? I said, because we're still going to have our poker in the fire with the, with the adoption agency, but this will just give us another opportunity. At first, he wasn't on board. Mm -hmm. He was like, no, I can't see all these kids coming into the house, me getting emotionally invested, and then them leaving. I, I don't have that emotional capacity. I, th that's going to be too much emotionally for me. So mm -hmm. um, it took me about six months to get him on board, but I finally got him on board to um, foster to adopt. So we went through the long, egregious process of the fostering process. Um, and mm -hmm. about halfway through it, the social worker said, wait a minute, guys, are you looking to adopt a baby? Because that's never going to happen with a foster to adopt process. Now, you might adopt a five, six, seven, eight-year-old who might have some attachment issues, but you know, you're not going to be adopting mm -hmm. a baby from the foster system. But by this time, we already took in kids. We we're fostering kids, a lot of kids, sibling groups, teenagers, toddlers, a lot of... We we're. And so not only did we enjoy helping out the foster kids, but it was also a nice opportunity to show our son how blessed he was to, you know, he has a loving home with a lot of love exactly. with everything he could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. He's very blessed. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, we wanted to show him. It's also nice to help other people. Anyway, long story short, we got certified the end of August, the first week of September, mm -hmm. we got a phone call from the hospital. They said, we have a baby girl. She was just born. If you guys are interested. Shirley, let me tell you, with the quickness, our nursery went from all blue to all pink in like 40 minutes. Talk about gender stereotypes. So I go to the, we go to the hospital and um, we're holding our daughter. That's it. So we bring her home. Fast forward three months, we have to all go back to court to finalize the adoption, right? In walks the birth mother. We've never seen her before. We've never talked to her before. Nothing. So the birth mother asks her attorney, can I talk to Jason and Eric before we go into the courtroom? So, you know, we're a little nervous. Oh, Lord, what's going on? So uh, whatever, her attorney had to clear it with our attorney and the law guardian and all this other nonsense protocol crap. So we did go into her room <clears throat> and we shut the door and surely she just starts thanking us profusely. Thank you for stepping up. Thank you for adopting this child I brought into the world. And we're think, I'm thinking, shouldn't we be thanking you? <laughs> but anyways, come to find out, Shirley, our daughter's birth mother is Filipino, and our daughter's birth father is half mm -hmm. Irish. Eric is full Filipino, and I'm okay. half Irish. So go figure. Interesting. Yeah. So listen to this. But are you ready for this? We're about to leave the room. And I said, Julia, do you have any questions for us at all? Now, listen, if I'm about to give up a child for adoption, I'm going to ask, what's your religion? Are you going to beat this child? Well, I'm like, I'm going to ask six million questions, right? Mm -hmm. Any idea what the question she asked us was? What are you going to name the child? That's what she asked like us. Amanda? What did you name the yeah. baby? Why? I did. <laughs> That's interesting how they both ask the same thing, because I'm assuming after you told Amanda Luke, did she take the conversation anywhere No, else? she said, thank you. Have a good life. Love you. And same yeah. with this girl. What a blessing how it was a smooth transition for you and Eric for both adoptions. Yes, we're, we're very blessed because trust me, we've heard horror stories. I will say this with the with our daughter. Our birth mother told us, she said, I never knew I was pregnant. She said, I never knew I was pregnant. She said, I woke up at two o'clock in the morning and my bed was soaked. She said, I called my best friend and I said, I think I'm pregnant. I think my water just broke. Can you take me to the hospital? She said, my friend took me to the hospital. The doctor came in and said, you're four and a half centimeters dilated. We need to take you in. Now, that was a blessing because she never was emotionally 
she was never, you know, emotionally attached to the child because she never knew she was pregnant. Which, by the way, she said, even if I did know I was pregnant, I couldn't keep this child. I, I'm not in a position to keep a child at all. Mm -hmm. So she wouldn't have. But it was just a blessing that she she didn't even know she was pregnant because she she never had a chance to emotionally bond with the baby. So it was a blessing on her end. Interesting. That's very interesting. Gives me uh, a very interesting uh, episode I need to do because the fact that for as a female, I never knew I was pregnant is very interesting and I don't have words for that, you know? So it would be nice to talk to somebody who was in that situation so I can really dig deep and ask some questions. No, because I know. I know. Now, listen, not I'm not know. a female. I don't know, but like, don't you get some breast tenderness? Don't you get some food cravings? Don't you? I mean. Period loss. Yeah. Belly getting big. I mean, so this is why it would be a very good conversation. <laughs> because <laughs> I got a lot of questions <laughs> so now blessing you have Luke you have Sylvia life is good so what made you get into coaching and do everything that you're doing you got your associates you got your bachelor's you got your master's life even through the negatives Jay you have accomplished so much why did you decide to go into the coaching so um when I, when I got my bachelor's degree, I got my bachelor's, uh, I, I told you I got dual study bachelor's degree, one in psychology. And so um, in a religious setting, you can do premarital mm -hmm. counseling. You can do marital counseling uh, with a bachelor's degree. And I had a bachelor's degree in psychology and that's what I did. And I loved it. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I could have took my master's degree and went mm -hmm. into counseling, but I did go into education instead, um, which that's a whole mm -hmm. nother beast. Um, uh let me just real quickly, when we were in Georgia, I actually worked in a hospital because obviously by federal mm -hmm. law, kids still um, are required to have an education, even if they're in the hospital long term. So if a kid had leukemia or what have you, if they're in the hospital for six months, they were still getting an education. So I worked in the hospital um, as a teacher. Oh. Okay. When I, when we moved to, and that makes sense. You know what? I've never, I never thought about that, but that makes sense. Somebody has to come in and teach that child while they're in the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Federal law. And, um, every child deserves a, a, an mm -hmm. education. Um, and so then when we moved to DC, that's when I, uh, started teaching, um, inner city, very rough. This was your last chance before you're behind bars or before you go into uh, a restricted situation. Uh, there was, there was teachers that left in ambulances. This was, I don't know if you ever seen higher ground. Mm -hmm. This was higher ground on meth. Yes. Um, oh, but, man. but I'm going to tell you something. And now I didn't get into this, but I was in special ed when I was younger. And the reason I was thrown into special ed, I think, because first of all, I had a speech impediment. And second of all, I think when they did the mm -hmm. testing on me, because my home life was so atrocious, I think they thought I had some emotional uh, issues, mm -hmm. which I probably did. Maybe I still do. But anyway, um, so when I went into to special ed in DC, I taught ED, emotional disturbance. Um, and do you know, every single year that I was there, I would get awards, certificates of achievements, best classroom management. And I think it's because not only could I relate to the kids, but I also used a lot of my theater, believe it or not, to regulate my class. Because if I would, I would take my class's temperature and I would see like two kids looking at each other and, you know, punking each other with their shoulders or whatever. And instead of going over there and addressing that, I would jump on my desk and belt out some opera. Then all of a sudden the kids would be like, okay, this dude's crazy. I'm just going to turn around and do my math. So there you go. So I just used, I just used what I had to regulate my class. Um... And, and it worked. I had best. And it doesn't surprise <laughs> me. It does not surprise me. So anyway, oh my I remember, so I remember, and, and I Did just, you come home and tell Flatline? <laughs> Did you come home and tell Flatline about this? Cause I know Flatline was like, you'd be like, you'd be like, Jay, what? you can't jump on your desk. The, I'm like, wh who am I talking to? What? How, uh, anyway, <laughs> no, you can't if you're an attorney, but we're going and listen, Listen, because my because I got results, my boss just let me do what I needed to do. I mean, I would bring up my kids reading. I would bring up their math levels. I would 
Um, and I'm telling you something, Shirley, I would get, well, I don't want to call them love letters, but I would get love letters from parents, not, not romantic love letters. Like you did a, B and C to my son and, and I, and I am forever grateful. Um, I, I had, I loved my kids. I loved my students. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, they weren't just my students. They, I love them. They, 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 I, I was them. How about that? Got it. But anyways, I was telling a teacher one time, I said, why in the world do we not have any books that reflect the community that we work in? Um, and I don't necessarily mean from a racial background or a gender background or this or that. But when I started working with kids years ago, 90% mm -hmm. of my kids came from a home with a mom and a dad. Well, years and years later, 10% of my kids um, came, lived in a home with a mom and dad. Everybody else lived with either a single parent, a foster parent, a grandmother, a this or a that. And so I said, so I would go to the um, uh, principal and say, do we have any money for books? And of course, we had no money for books. So I was complaining one time and mm -hmm. all of a sudden I went, duh, just write one. So that's where I wrote my book. I am loved right where I am. And it tells every child, no matter what home you live in, no matter where you are, what you are loved and you're right where you're supposed to be. So that's where the book came from. So that was the inspiration. Yeah. Now, that was the inspiration behind the book. Now, to quickly get back to your question, and I know we're running out of time and, um, you know, I can talk until next Tuesday and then just take a breath and keep talking. But... Um, <laughs> But uh, I, st I, so when our, when our son was born, it was important that one of us stay home. And so we talked mm -hmm. and we decided it, it would be me that would pull out of work and I would stay home. So um, I did stay home and I love staying home. And, and I'm still very much uh, a, a big part of me as a stay at home dad. But <clears throat> I was also able to get into some coaching using a lot of my life experiences, using my education, using my degrees, using whatever, all of my resources. Um, and then one time I was watching a TEDx talk and I saw this lady give a talk on betrayal trauma. And I was so moved and so interested, I sent her an email and she said, well, I have a membership, uh, exclusive membership community online. Would you like to come and check it out? And so I checked it out and I, I fell hook, line and sinker. I, I was like, wow, this is like stirring something in me. So I told her and she said, would you want to go through my course to become certified as a betrayal trauma practitioner? And I said, absolutely. And I did. And now that's 90% of my work is betrayal trauma. That's and, and it suits you perfectly. It really does. It suits you perfectly. It literally does because from what you experienced as a child and how your life changed drastically to the blessing of a life you have now, you're not like sitting there on your couch like, oh my God, why me? Why did you do this, God? No, you figured out a way to make it. You left your home. You were homeless, even homeless. You found a way to get two jobs at what did, 14 mm -hmm. to pay 128 little dollars a month or one, 180. Did you say 180 or something 180. a month, 180 a month. And from 14 to 18, you were busting your little teenage ass. And you never gave up. You went to go get your college. I mean, your story is very inspiring. So now my question is, what inspiration do you have to offer to our listeners? And so many different angles. Number one, from the angle, you could base it on the angle from your childhood, from adolescence, from your teenage years, from in your relationship as two gay parents adopting two children, what inspiration do you have to somebody? We live in a world where time is so rough, Jay. Society is mean to you. Um, you know how it is. Oh, two fathers can't have two kids. Why the fuck not? I'm all in support of a child needs to be in a happy home. And sometimes a male and a female is not always a happy environment for a child to be in. To me, it doesn't fucking matter, but there are other people out there that's not going to see it the same and they have a right to their opinion. That's fine. But what inspiration do you have to offer that individual? Well, first, let me just say this. We're, we're, we're two dads who also adopted uh, transracially. 
So, so, so you're talking, you know, diversity uh, to the second power, and that comes with its challenges as well. Um, but mm -hmm. this, I just want to say this. One of the things that I want to do is I want to take my trauma lessons and decrease mm -hmm. the suffering that people cause themselves from the pain other people gave mm -hmm. them. So let me so let me just break that down real quick. So Shirley, right now, hypothetically speaking, I call you a B, right? A B-I-T-C-H, right? Let's just say I call you a B word, right? Okay. Okay. So I just offended you. I kind of hurt you, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so mm -hmm. I caused pain. But now let's just say for the next week, you walk around your house. That Mr. J called me a bitch. Mm, I'm, oh, I can't wait to. Oh, oh. And the, now your whole week, you just gave yourself a lot of suffering. So I gave you pain. Yes. But you caused yourself suffering. So one of the things I want to do yes. is I want to take the lessons of my trauma and reduce the suffering that people give themselves with the pain that other people gave them. And one of the, because listen, one of the things I tell people with betrayal all the time, you gotta, you gotta put your narrative in check. You gotta put your narrative in check. And listen, mm -hmm. our minds can go crazy. How many times when, 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 let's just say in life we were broken up with and we find out the person we were with mm -hmm. is dating somebody. Well, you know what we're thinking of? We're thinking of them rocking in a hammock while their new date is feeding them, you know, uh, grapes and fanning them with fig leaves. I mean, our mind just plays tricks on it. We need to get our own narrative in check, you know? So if I can inspire people, it's number one, get your narrative in check with things because you call, even though other people cause you pain, we cause our own self suffering, which leads me to my next thing is before you, you and, and by the way, I am an intrapersonal relationship coach. And that means I deal with the I deal with the relationship people have with themselves, because one of my mottos is the relationship you have with yourself sets the tone for all other relationships around you. If you don't have self forgiveness, it's going to be very hard to forgive others. If you don't have self love, it's going to be very hard to love others, not going to be impossible. It's just going to be a little bit more difficult. So one of the things I, I try to do and inspire other people is, is, is constantly date yourself, get to know yourself. Surely you're a different person today than you were five years ago. And you're going to be a different person five years from now than you are today. You are not a human being. You are a human evolution. So, so you are constantly evolving. You have to constantly get to know this new Shirley. And the more, you know, Shirley, the more you can present yourself to the world because I'm going to tell you another thing, too. I, I, I'm a wedding officiant. And you know how many times I'll stand in front of two kids, basically two teenagers, mm -hmm. in front who are who are exchanging wedding vows? And you know what I think about? I'll say, these guys are exchanging I do's. They don't even know who the I am is. And that's very unfair because now you're going to put an expectation on that other person to, quote, know you and fulfill all your needs about when you don't even know who the hell you are. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I can keep going on, but I'm going to let you get a question in if you want. <laughs> you so silly. I'm going to let you get a question in. Well, we're going to be wrapping okay. it up. So do you have any final questions before we wrap it up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When am I going to be on again? I'm just kidding. No, listen, I'll end with, I'll end with what that Midler said in beaches. Okay. Enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? <laughs> What do I it's think about it's you? It's a funny joke. Told, first of she all, was saying, I already told you. I think, no, I'm going <laughs> to tell you what I think about you. I really do like your energy because I'm going to tell you, Jay, me, I'm just like, I'm cool. I'm not a flat line like Eric, but I'm not as animated as you are. <laughs> so you bring healthy balance to me because you put out all that energy. I told you what made me laugh was when I said, Jay, where's your headphones? Oh, I need headphones. Honey, where's my headphones? <laughs> This is the image I have of you in my head. And then you guys can't see him, but he has pink headphones on. So I think he stole them from Sylvia. <laughs> yeah, I okay. think they're frozen. I'm going to start singing Let Sylvia. It Go. So this is why Let It Go. <laughs> so as we end today, it was absolutely amazing talking to you. You're a ball of oh. energy. And I love that. I really do. Your story is very inspirational because you took the shit 
and you turned it into gold. Literally, that's what you did. Um, I love the fact how you adopted two children. You have Luke and you have Sylvia and you're living such a positive life. So one thing I like that you said is you're not just a human. I am not the same person I was five years ago and I'm not going to be the same person five years from now because I am a human that is constantly evolving. And I like that. I definitely like that. So as we end today, guys, as always, thank you for listening. And remember to voice yourself, love yourself and be yourself. And until the next podcast, have a great one. for tuning in to Fun Pale Podcast. If you want to continue the conversation or share your takeaways, I want to hear from you. Head on over to the website or join our Facebook community and comment your favorite part of the show or share your thoughts. I want to hear what you have to say. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Chat with you next week.